Good morning. This is lecture two of measurement science at the University of Twente, the Netherlands, uh, for Wednesday, 13 November 2013. And this is Edwin Carlin uh, giving the lecture from the University of Scuba in Japan. Today we're going to talk about two topics, measurement fundamentals and measurement characteristics. In measurement fundamentals, we're going to talk about units and standards, and then we're going to discuss many different types of measurement systems. And then in the second half of the lecture, we're going to discuss measurement characteristics, essentially transfer functions, and we'll look at static and dynamic characteristics of both of those. Um, today, also, uh, please check Blackboard because homework number two is assigned, uh, and it will be based on the content of this lecture, lecture number two. So all measurement systems can be represented with block diagrams that essentially show the essential pieces of each one of the measurement systems. Uh, in this example we have five blocks, one representing the sensor, a variable conversion element, a signal processing element, which gives you your output measurement, and then some type of signal transmission, could be some remote type of sensor. Um, <clears throat> signal recording, representation, output, LCD screen, etc. The input of this whole thing, this whole measurement system, uh, is the measured variable, which we call the measurand. We're going to talk about today and how to describe the measurand of the, fun, of the measurement system. Now we have units and quantities. Units is a particular value that represents a physical quantity with a numerical value and a quantity is a property ascribed to phenomena, process, or object that can be assigned a value. For example, an electrical current is a quantity and the ampere is the unit. The measurement of quantities requires a system of units that is accurate, easy to understand and use, and universal, hopefully, between different scientific or engineering disciplines and between different countries as well. The mechanics field led in the definition and characterization of scientific units, and the second, second the time uh, unit, was well established by the time the metric system of length and mass was adopted in France uh, in, in the late 1700s. Now the SI unit system, Système International de Units, is an international system of units that includes MKS, mechanical units, and MKSA units, which are typically used for electrical. From the basic SI units, all other units can be derived. Now the fundamental SI units are listed on slide number five. The quantity, length, mass, time, electrical current, temperature, luminous intensity, this is an optical um, quantity, and matter. And then the corresponding units, meter, kilogram, second, ampere, kelvin, candela, mole, and then the symbol associated with one of those units. And then we have two supplementary fundamental units, quantities and units, plane angle, solid angle, and then radian, steradian, and then the symbol associated with those. Um, you will be um, required to remember each one of these quantities and the unit associated with it. The meter is the length of the path traveled by light in vacuum during an interval of one over the speed of light, which is a second, okay? The quantity is meter, unit name, uh, the quantity is length, unit name is meter, and then the symbol as we discussed. Now, the second is the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of cesium-133 atom. Remember that. Um, remember that it's 
the cesium atom and we're looking at um, basically atomic transitions to define this quantity okay in the unit now the kilogram the unit of mass is equal to the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram it's the last remaining base unit of the SI that is still defined by a material artifact, an actual physical material. Um, it's kept with six official copies in the vault in BIPM, and we'll talk about what that is in, 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 in Paris, in France. And still, since the late 1880s, um, this international prototype is made of an alloy 90% platinum and 10% iridium. Um, the quantity mass, kilogram, and then unit. The ampere um, is defined as the constant current if maintained in two straight parallel conductors of infinite length, negligible circular cross-section of place one meter apart in vacuum would produce a force equal to 20 micronewton per meter of length between those conductors, and then the associated quantity, unit name, and ampere. The Kelvin, unit of thermodynamic temperature, is the fraction of 1 over 273.16, which is uh, rounded up, um, of the thermodynamic temperature of the triple point of water. The quantity is temperature, unit is Kelvin, and then the symbol K. Mole is the amount of substance of a system that contains many elementary quantities, as there are atoms, and 0.012 kilograms of carbon-12, the stable isotope of carbon. So the quantity is the substance, unit name mole, and then the symbol MOL. And you will use this later in the course in lecture number seven when Walter Oldhaus talks about chemical sensors. The candela is a luminous intensity quantity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic single wavelength radiation of frequency 540 times 10 to the power 12 hertz and that has a radiant intensity in the direction of 1 over 683 watts per steridian which is a solid angle okay um, you won't have to remember that much detail for the exams and the homework, but it's important that you remember that uh, candela is the, is the standard quantity for luminous intensity for optical systems, um, and then the unit name is candela. So again, summarizing these, the standard units, so I've mentioned these three times, which means it will be on the homework and it will be on the exam. So. Um, all you have to do is memorize these seven standard units and put it into your memory bank um, and it will serve you throughout your whole career when you go to these later on. Now from those seven standard units we can derive all other units in the SI system. This is a list of area, volume, velocity, acceleration, angular velocity, and all of the standard unit names for each one of these and you can see each one of the symbol is a combination of some new sim Newton but then Newton then can be further um, broken down into the basic SI unit which is kilogram meter per second squared so each one of these you can practice on this and you will have to do this for the homework and the exam it's good practice this is a little diagram to show that you can derive all units based on the SI base units and you can go over this uh, in, in practice if you haven't seen this type of thing before. Okay, so that must mean that each quantity has a single unit. Wrong. Um, unfortunately, dis between disciplines and between different countries, there are many units for a single physical phenomena. For example, distance. Uh, this is just a few that you can pull out of old literature, new literature, different countries. Foot, the rod, pole, perch, 
furlong, fur, fathom, which is basically the depth in the sea, international mile, um, acre, um, etc., etc. And all of the many of the other phenomena like pressure and these other things also have many units that you need to be able to work with. So you really need to pay attention to your units um, where you're, when you're working as an engineer or a scientist. So since there are many different types of units for the same phenomena, then we have conversion factors, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are a reference that you can use uh, throughout this course and later um, if you want to print these out or have these in a little handbook that you can convert, you can easily convert between between different units for a particular quantity. So we have second moment of area, volume, density, mass, force, torque, inertia, here we are, pressure, um, some additional conversion factors for pressure, one inch of water, one tor to millibar pascal is equal to one newton per meter square. And then we have energy, work, and heat. Um, again, we have many different units here, um, joule, calorie, BTU, um, etc. So you need to be able to be, you need to be very careful on which units you use where and how you convert them. Additional conversion factors again for power, uh, for work, I'm sorry. And then we have power, conversions, work, a watt, kilowatt, foot pounds per second, horsepower, um, velocity, acceleration, mass flow rate so remember mass must be some vol some some mass some kilogram per unit time volume flow rate which is some volume per unit time specific energy this is heat per unit volume dynamic viscosity typically this is for hydraulic systems and the kinematic viscosity kinematic is the um, it's a dynamic viscosity in, in, uh, <clears throat> in, other, in other terms. And you can see also we have different units here, like the poise for dynamic viscosity, and then in kinematic, kinematic viscosity we have the Stokes um, uh, unit. So please pay attention to these units. And then, of course, then we also have physical constants. Um, and again, I won't go out through all of these, but um, in general, as an engineer or a scientist, you should have some of these memorized, such as the velocity of light, electronic charge, Planck's constant. Um, you will need to know Faraday's constant when you do the electrical, electrical chemical sensors in lecture number seven, um, Boltzmann's constant, um, Avogadro's number um, and also the permeability of free space and the permittivity of free space that go along with Maxwell's equations in electromagnetics and electrical engineering. So these numbers um, that represent physical constants are quite important and then the units that are associated with them as well. Okay, so that short introduction to quantities and units um, um, gives you a basic overview of the field. Um, there are many more units that we didn't go over um, in depth, but um, it really depends on the physical phenomena that you want to describe. But knowing the um, knowing the the, fun, the seven fundamental SI units you can as I said, uh, derive all other units um, in either using conversion factors or directly um, uh, decomposing each one of the uh, units into the fundamental units, and then you should be able to um, to be able to derive those um, for common for common units that you will use as electrical engineers and we'll get some practice in, in homework number two.
That brings us to slide number 25, and we'll start with standards. Um, standards are an extremely important part of measurement science. Uh, a standard is essentially a, um, <clears throat> a, 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 a measurement standard is essentially a, um, a physical entity that's measured, that's used as a reference in which to determine if your measurement system is working correctly. For example, if you want to measure a voltage on a voltmeter, you have a resistor and you have current and you measure a voltage and your uh, digital instrument gives you a certain indication of a voltage. Well, how do you know that that's correct? Well, in reality, you don't know it's correct unless the instrument has been calibrated with a standard. And this standard, um, there are many different types of standards um, that quantify those basic quantities that we had earlier, the electrical current, and etc., etc. So we have a working standard, a secondary standard, primary standard and then an international standard. Okay, the international standards, these are kept in vaults that are used um, 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 to characterize the primary, the secondary, and the working standards to make sure that the numbers that these standards are giving are correct. So the international standard is the highest accuracy standard, highest accuracy standard for a particular unit of measure primary kept in national laboratories and it's used to calibrate the secondary standards. The secondary standards are used to calibrate the working standards and the working standards are typically what, it, what in, are in all laboratories so they should be in all laboratories. So if you want an oscilloscope or if you have a, a digital voltmeter or something like this then there should be a standard in the laboratory that allows you to plug into your unit and it it, it will read out a value for the standard and that you can tell whether it needs to be calibrated um, to see if some offset has developed over time. So these standards are ex extremely important when you want to do accurate measurements. And we will um, expand on these um, in more detail as we go through the lecture in the next about, about 20, 20 slides on standards. Okay. So in this lecture, we will talk about six different types of standards, time, length, mass, current, voltage, and resistance. Time, the standard is a cesium clock. It's an atomic transition, transition of cesium. Length is derived by time. Mass is derived by a prototype. This is a physical quantity made of an alloy, platinum, iridium. Electrical current is derived from voltage and resistance. Voltage comes from a Josephson junction, superconductors, um, and we physically measure a voltage from that. And resistance comes from the quantum Hall effect. Now I want you to remember these six standards. Um, and um, basically this slide, I want you to remember what each one of these represents and then how the standard um, is measured. Cesium clock derived by time, prototype derived from voltage and resistance, Josephson junction, quantum Hall effect. <clears throat> the eighteen seventy five meter convention, BIPM, which is the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, was established in Paris, France. And this provides the basis for a single coherent system of measurements throughout the world traceable to the international system of units. So we have these standard units and then we have standards that allow us to characterize exactly what those, what those units and quantities represent. Okay. Now the dissemination of the units, as in the case of mass and time, to coordination through international comparisons of national measurement standards 
as in electricity and ionizing radiation. We'll get into this a little bit more. Then this is an example of a platinum iridium weight standard that's kept in vacuum because everything oxidizes. As it oxidizes, it consumes some of the material, and over time, the weight changes. And this is what we try to um, try to avoid. Now, I said earlier that we have four different categories of these standards. And the international standard is typically the one that will be kept in in a high vacuum, low contamination system, and you very rarely take it out of its environment because every time you take it out of its environment, it becomes contaminated. So these are isolated and not used for daily use. This is obviously not a this is quite an old vacuum system for containing or to prevent contamination, but it gives you the idea. The time unit second, okay, as I said earlier, it's the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition of two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. That's what you should remember. Okay, it's it's a it's a it's an atomic transition of cesium one thirty three, and amazingly, um, in, these are different molecules that represent the second. The frequency uncertainty is ten to the power minus fifteen. That's the uncertainty of the estimation of the second using this standard. What does that mean? It means that the standard will neither gain nor lose one second in more than 60 million years. Okay, And this is, continues to improve over time. You can see the clock uncertainty over the unit of time in years. And we're, we're now beyond 2010. So you can see that this is, we continue to improve this almost on a uh, an exponential that looks like a logarithmic scale. Incredibly precise. Now the length unit is also realized using this time standard. Okay. Um, it's the primary standard and it consists of an helium neon laser and the optical frequency um, is monitored by these atomic clocks that are used for the realization of the second. And it has a relative uncertainty of 2.5 to the minus 11. And this corresponds to one millimeter uncertainty with respect to the circumference of the Earth. That's the precision of this, uh, of the meter standard. The mass unit kilogram <clears throat> it follows that the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram is always one kilogram exactly. However, the accumulation of contaminants on the surface, the international prototype is subject to reversible surface contamination that approaches around one microgram per year in mass. The CIPM which is defined on the bottom in both French and English, declared that pending further research, the reference mass of the international prototype is that immediately after cleaning and washing by a specific procedure. Okay, and this is an example of how much the, um, uh, this international standard has changed over the course from 1889 to 1989. And these are in micrograms the change in the mass, just due to contamination and oxidation of the material. Forty copies of the original kilogram were made and they will all vary in mass now. And you can read a little bit about this on your own as well. Now there are many efforts to try to define new kilogram standards. Um, this is an example of trying to use silicon, a special combination of silicon because it's one of the most pure uh, substances, man-made substances that's available. Uh, 
And even up until 2010, this is still an active area of research. And you can see that the platinum iridium uh, standard, which is 122 year, two years old, is still used. Um, but this particular system won't be used until the uncertainty can fall below 2 times 10 to the minus 8 before CIPM and BIPM will replace the standard platinum iridium with this new silicon 28 sphere. Still an active area of research, primarily in, 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 in the physics, in the, in the field of physics, for defining these standards. And all countries have physics departments and chemistry departments just working on developing new standards and on also maintaining um, the standards that exist for each one of these uh, particular units and quantities. Now, electrical standards, um, the introduction on January 1, 1990, um, of conventional values of the Josephson junction and the von Klitzing constant uh, following adoption by CIPM in 1988 has resulted in significant improvement in the worldwide coherence of electrical measurements and, and how we go about in doing this, okay, and incorporating new quantum effects in electrical metrology. For voltage, we use the Josephson junction. Now this is the phenomena of current flow across two weakly coupled superconductors separated by a very thin insulating layer. The reproducibility of the voltage standard using this type of structure is a few parts in 10 to the power 10, incredibly precise. The basic element of the array is the Josephson junction in the form of a superconductor insulator, superconductor sandwich, when irradiated with, irradiated with microwave energy, such as a, uh, these junctions exhibit a DC potential, which is uniquely determined by the frequency of the microwave radiation, the electronic charge, and Planck's constant, with a single junction providing a few millivolts. In other words, a Josephson junction can act as a superb frequency div to DC converter voltage converter. So if you have a very precise frequency, you can generate a very precise DC voltage that's only dependent on those fundamental constants, as I said, electronic charge and Planck's constant. Okay, this is how approximately how it works. It's done at low temperature, 4.2 Kelvin. Um, you can read a little bit more about this if you're interested on your own, but essentially this voltage that we have is dependent on N, the number of junctions that you have, the frequency of the incoming microwave radiation, and then these fundamental constants. This is the ideal type of situation. This is an example of uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States, a 10 volts Josephson Junction standard chip where they have many junctions, 16 arrays and 1,263 junctions. And for the total path there are 20,288 junctions in series. Um, this is an example of the measurement system that's cooled um, to 4.2 Kelvin. This one is actually in Switzerland. And then the Josephson junction constant KJ90 uh, can be estimated. And you can see that K sub J is equal to 2 times the electronic charge divided by Planck's constant, which are fundamental constants. And then the Josephson constant is equal to 483,597.9 gigahertz per volt. Okay, the Hall effect, little review if you haven't had it. If we have a uh, 
particular type of material. Okay, a voltage drives a current in the positive direction, so you can see the voltage is driving the current in the x direction. We have then the normal ohmic resistance of the material, which is R is equal to V over I. A magnetic field in the positive z direction applied shifts the charge carriers in the negative y direction so that's pointing to the left away from the material this generates a Hall potential because the charges are being displaced in the material and the Hall potential which is a voltage that voltage drop you measure in the y direction um, gives you your Hall resistance so in the quantum Hall effect we use the same basic concepts as a resistance standard and the resistance of the material in ohms is quantized as a function of the applied magnetic field the steps that occur in the plot on the lower right um, occur at resistance values that do not depend on the properties of the material but depend on fundamental constants. Again, H, Planck's constant, and electronic charge. Okay? And then the resistance unit is referred to the von Klinsing resistance, which is similar to the, to the previous one in voltage, but it's different and this resistance standards is good to a few parts in 10 to the power 9 incredibly precise for defining resistance so then having this voltage and resistance standard then we can also consider the coulomb the farad and the ampere and how we can derive these from these other basic units the Josephson junction voltage standard and quantum Hall resistance standard allow redefinition of the charge unit Coulomb you can see so Coulomb will then be one over the electronic charge and you can read this in fact the capacitance unit farad can also be def derived from this unit and most importantly the ampere now linked to a force in Newton can be redefined as the Coulomb per second. Okay, so please read through this to to see how this definition and derivation of these fundamental standards goes through and how we bring it back to the ampere, which is this fundamental unit. So voltage resistance and then we have ampere, which is a fundamental SI unit, and how we come back to defining that using these standards. Okay, so that concludes the first part of the lecture, which consisted of units and standards, and then the different types of um, uh, standards that we can have for, remember there are six of them, Um, and uh, we will have some more practice on each one of those sections in the first part of this lecture uh, in the first in the second homework assignment um, that would be on blackboard today okay now the second half of this lecture is about measurement characteristics okay and these are really about how we're going to characterize the sensor and maybe part of the variable conversion element how we convert the measure end into a measurable signal okay and first we have to make some definitions first we have a transfer function okay with an input x and an output y and then we define this mathematically y equal f of x so you have this operation some function so the system is going to perform some function on the input x and give you the output y and then you can also extract x out of taking the inverse of that system 
and then the magnitude of the transfer function and, and also the phase change of the signal as it propagates through the system can also be extracted from the transfer function which we call h of s which is y over x that's the transfer function of the system now in the system specifications we have four types of characteristics static dynamic environmental and reliability so static pretty much describes the steady state performance very slow changes to the system uh, before you apply a signal after a long time your signal has stabilized this is static or steady state behavior dynamic is when you apply a temporal based signal time based signal in how the system is going to respond um, how fast or how slow uh, the dynamic behavior and then the environmental characteristics um, this has to do more with um, how the sensor behaves during exposure to external conditions, pressure, temperature, vibration, radiation, and then reliability. Typically this describes the sensor life expectancy. How long will the sensor behave? How will, over time, the signal or the measurement behavior drift or change? And that's essentially the reliability of the system. Now, the static characteristics of instruments, um, I've listed several here, and we'll go over these a bit more, and I will give some examples of these, but it's for you to have a good understanding, it's better if you do read through and make sure that you understand the examples in the lecture. Accuracy and inaccuracy, precision, repeatability, reproducibility, tolerance, calibration, range or span, this is a full-scale input, full-scale output, linearity, sensitivity, threshold, resolution, sensitivity to disturbance, to drift, for example, hysteresis, offset, and dead space. And then we'll go through and we'll define what each one of these are and how you can quantify them in your measurement system. So accuracy and inaccuracy, this is always a good one. Accuracy is the capacity of a measuring instrument to give results close to the true value of the measurement quantity. And an inaccuracy is a measure of absolute and relative errors, where the absolute error is the result minus the true value, and the relative error is the absolute error divided by the true value. A pressure gauge with a measurement range between 0 and 10 bar is specified to have a measurement error plus or minus 1% full scale. What does that mean? Okay, so the full scale, we said, is 10 bar, from 0 to 10 bar. 1% of that 10 bar is 0 0.1 bar. So a measurement reading plus or minus 0.1 bar over the entire range, specified range, gives you the following. 0 0.1 plus or minus 0 0.1 bar. 1 bar plus or minus 0 0.1 bar. 10 bar plus or minus 0 0.1 bar. So If you're using this large range pressure sensor to measure small pressure variations, you can see in the first one you have 100% error because the sensor is made to measure large ranges. You need to measure ranges that are small, then you need to choose a pressure sensor that has a smaller full-scale range. You can see that if you're measuring pressures on the order of 10 bar, then you get 1% error in your measurement. Okay, that's typically how that works. Now, precision is related to the random error in the measurement, and every measurement has random error. Nothing is perfect. Okay, for repeated measurements, and this is important, and we'll talk about this, I think, later in Lecture 5 when we talk about statistics, 
The result is you have some mean plus or minus a standard deviation, okay, of the statistical variation. And this is only true, only true, if you have a very large number of samples, and we'll talk about this later. So be aware of this. If you're using Excel or something like this and you go to compute the standard deviation, be very careful how you use this. You need at least 100 points in, able, in, it, in order to be able to use this very straightforward uh, equation, mu plus a standard deviation. So be very, very careful with this. But for now, when standard deviation sigma is small, then the in instrument has a very high precision. Okay, and you can see if you have a normal distribution, so if your random variable has a normal distribution, if the standard deviation, one standard deviation, plus or minus one standard deviation, then you're within 68.2, then you capture basically 68.2% of the area of this Gaussian distribution, okay? Now, if you go out to three sigma, for example, then you're 99.97% um, high precision. Then you're all, almost always going to be extremely high precision. You're not going to miss much. One, sti one standard sig one, one sigma, standard deviation means that something around 32 percent right error in your system something in this in this range um, so when the standard deviation is small when you're out to three sigma something like this and it's very very precise and we'll talk a little bit more about this later when we talk about statistics so a good way to think about this is if you have three robots and the robots are to throw darts at a dartboard and the idea is that the, pro the robots are programmed to throw the darts, all darts in the center of the dartboard. So robot one, you can see there's a spread of the black dots, low precision, low accuracy. Robot number two, all the darts are away from the center, but they have a small cluster, so it has high precision, but low accuracy. Robot number three gets them all in the center and all clustered around the same point, high precision, high accuracy. Now accuracy and errors, we have systematic errors and random errors. These result from a variety of factors interfering variables, temperature, drift, changes in chemical structure, mechanical stresses. The measurement process changes the measure in. Could be loading errors. Transmission process changes the signals, attenuation. Systematic errors can be com corrected and compensated using feedback or filtering. Now random errors, also called noise, a signal that carries no information. So all of the it's incoherent. True random errors, white noise, typically follow a normal dis distribution. Sources of randomness, repeatability of the measure end itself, environmental noise, transmission noise, for example. Now, when you're doing a measurement, your signal to noise ratio, you want it to be as large as possible, greater than one. Typically, in measurement practice, a good rule of thumb is a signal-to-noise ratio is three, at least three, three or greater. With knowledge of the signal characteristics, it may be possible to interpret a signal with a low signal-to-noise ratio. And we'll talk about this, actually. There, there are ways to, uh, to, to uh, build measurement systems that can measure low signal-to-noise ratios. A lock-in amplifier is one that we'll talk about later when we do modulation and de synchronous demodulation measurement systems. Tolerance, this is related to accuracy and defines the maximum error expected from an instrument. Okay, and you can see these, you have tolerance bands on resistance, you know, just straightforward. The range or span defines the minimum and maximum values of a quantity that the instrument measures. For the example, the pressure gauge. So the range was 10 bar. 
linearity, output reading of the instrument, linear proportional to the measure end. Think about superposition, okay, linearity. This is an example of a linear, out, uh, a linear system. The little x's are the measured outputs for a particular measure end. And then the straight line is a fit, at least a fit to the, to the output input characteristics. And this is typically called the calibration curve for your system. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can assess the nonlinearity. The first one is endpoint nonlinearity. We'll do some of this in the homework. It's very straightforward. And the other one is a smallest quadratic error best fit nonlinearity, where we can fit a straight line to the endpoints of a nonlinear curve and then look to see how well we can fit that. And then we get a metric that tells us whether as a, as a way to look at the nonlinearity. Now, sensitivity is the, basically the slope of the calibration curve that we talked about before, which is basically a change. We do a slope, a change of, for a change of the output reading over, for a particular change in the input reading will give the sensitivity of the instrument. And that will be, the unit of that will be the output unit over the input unit. Threshold, the minimum measure end value before the instrument will respond. This is straightforward. Resolution uh, is defined as the smallest detectable change that the sensor can uh, produce. Uh, signal quantization and A to Z analog to digital conversion. Or a, a sensor, for example, a potentiometer. This is an example of a wire round potentiometer as a position sensor. Uh, so you see the two block diagrams of the system. Two is um, is the is the um, is the little um, metal uh, blade that's going to go across the wire round potentiometer, and the position sensitivity will be basically the difference between the two. Uh, the distance between the, the two adjacent wires. So when you're on position XA here, you define a particular resistance RA, and when you go here to XB, then you have RB. That's, the, that's going to be the position resolution for this type of, of instrument. Very simple example. Then we have sensitivity to disturbance. This is drift. You can see that the um, 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 the ideal characteristic input versus output is the red line with no offset. Now, if your input is offset, you can see the green line. Then your output, your new output, due to the input drift, is going to be the blue line. So the input, if it drifts, then it's going to the output is going to drift. So you have to, your measurement system, you have to identify that if this is a problem. If it's a problem, then you need to have some sort of feedback or some correction to identify if the drift is causing a problem. This is another example of sensitivity to drift. We have zero drift in part A, sensitivity drift, in B, and then both of them. So you see in the zero drift, essentially the characteristic from the uh, input-output origin will drift, characteristic drifts away from the, the origin, so from the nominal characteristic. And But you can see in this case the sensitivity is the same, it's just an offset, uh, the starting offset. Instead of being the for zero input, you get zero output. Now you have for zero input, you have a drift of the output, which can easily be corrected, but it's a problem. Sensitivity drift, basically the, the, the slope of the line is changing, and then you can have a combination of these things. Hysteresis, if you've had the electromagnetics course, or some, um, this is common in, in, uh, in, in magnetic systems. Um, hysteresis, when you scan the input and output 
in different directions, then you can get a different characteristic, which is called hysteresis. And you can read through this to, to define those different characteristics. Dead space is essentially when your input variable is changing, then the output only changes over a certain range, and when the output is dead, then we call this the dead space. Okay, th so those are some examples of static characteristics, and now we can to the dynamic characteristics, um, and these are essentially um, measurement system behavior between the time you're measuring quantity changes values and the time the instrument attains a steady state response. So a step response at the input, how is the uh, sensor going to respond in time? The reason for these dynamic characteristics is because we can have energy storage elements in the system. So inertial masses and inductances in, in the form of capacitances, these can be electrical or thermal. These are going to store energy and they need to either have time to charge or to discharge. Okay. Now for these dynamic characteristics we can have a zero order instrument, first order instrument, second order instrument. Of course you can have higher order instruments but we'll stick to these three. We have noise, how we characterize this in the units for noise, the response time, and then frequency response. Dynamic characteristics. Any, time, any linear time invariant measurement system, the general relationship can be written between the input and the output for time greater than zero. So you can see that uh, we have this expansion of variables where our input is qi, our output is q0, and depending on the order of the system, then we're going to have these differential number of terms, depending on whether we have first, second, zero, first, second uh, order type of system. Now the Dynamic characteristics are determined by analyzing the response of the system to the different inputs. So we can have a impulse response, or we can have an impulse input, a step, a ramp, a sinusoid, or noise. Okay, We will consider step input changes to the measurements in this case, but the general procedure can be used for these other types of input stimulus to the system. For a zero-order system, step input changes in the measure and A0, Q0 will equal to B0, QI, and then we have this general equation defining the output, the instrument output, Q0, in terms of the input and these essentially um, scaling coefficients. So in the first plot on the top, the measure in quantity changes with the step and then the output changes in a zero order instrument. Okay, which you can see that this is going to be an instantaneous response. So in this case, we don't have charge storage elements that are affecting the response. You don't have to charge or discharge these energy storage units in the system. It's a zero order instrument. First order instrument, <clears throat> essentially step input changes in the measure end. Uh, you can go through the algebra here, um, but our, it's going to be then a differential equation. We have a storage element in this unit. And Q output, QO, as a function of T, is going to be equal to QI with some initial condition, scaling factors, and then an exponent, one minus an exponential response. And K1 is a time constant for the system. First order sensors have one element that stores energy and one that dissipates it. Okay, And so you can see for the step response, then the system is going to respond the instrument output. You can see the first, the, the, the measured quantity ideally if you had a zero order instrument and then in reality we have to we have to charge the 
instrument elements and we get this exponential response. So the time constant is usually defined at the 63% time, the rise time. So we can then use our standard um, uh, differential equations um, in our ways to, to solve these first order differential equations uh, to characterize these first order instruments. Uh, an example of this is a mercury thermometer immersed in a fluid. Okay, so you can see um, that um, there's going to be a thermal resistance and a thermal capacitance. The temperature now is going to be our driving, the temperature of the fluid, and then we're going to have some temperature associated with the, the thermometer that's going to drive, let's say that this is a mercury thermometer, you're going to drive that to the particular level that indicates what the temperature of the fluid is, okay? Now, you look at this and you say, okay, what type of input was applied to the sensor? Let's say you're going to put the thermometer very quickly into the fluid, so we say that this is a step response. Uh, the parameters of the system, thermal capacitance of the mercury, thermal resistance of the glass to heat transfer. So basically you want to go to the mercury so that it heats, so that it expands, and so that it goes up into the tube of the thermometer and indicates a particular temperature. But uh, the system and how it responds depends on how the mercury responds to heat and how well you can get heat through the glass to the mercury to heat it. So we can use a first order system. Heat flow through the glass is essentially the temp fluid minus the temperature dependent, the time dependent temperature of the mercury in the in the thermometer divided by R. And then we can make this first order differential equation and then we can derive the temperature dependent response to this system. And then we have the first order system. So you can make models, electrical models, mechanical models, electrical model using these lumped elements about, uh, I believe, in, in uh, lecture number four of how to use these basic lumped elements to be able to model any type of first order instrument. Okay, making things a little more complicated now, second order instruments. Um, uh, of course, now with second order instrument, we're going to have a second order differential equation. Uh, so we have um, the differential equation outlined in red, and the response types now um, we can have underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped, and the response parameters are response time, peak overshoot, time to peak, and settling time. Now we are not going to talk about solving this differential equation um, today in, in this lecture. However, you should have some experience with solving this, um, this differential equation. Um, and um, perhaps we can make this one of the homework questions to be able to go through this basic differential equation to be able to uh, to pick out the essential pieces. You can go through this plot on the bottom of, of slide number 70 to see how the different response types are characterized and also the response parameters. Now an example of this is an accelerometer. You have accelerometer in your automobile that, that detects acceleration or deceleration of the car and if you decelerate too quickly uh, then an airbag deploys so you, do, you don't hit your head on the uh, on the windshield or part of the front of the car. And the accelerometer essentially consists of a seismic mass, something that will move when it decelerates, um, a capacitor to detect that movement, a sensor interface to take mechanical movement into an electrical signal, and then a charge to voltage converter, basically. Um, if you have a capacitor there, you want to take charge and you want to put that into a voltage and then you have an actuator so essentially when this mass moves 
you're going to then bring it back to its original position and then um, in order to make the uh, bring this back to zero so you're always working from this zero point this is a feedback type of sensor so you can detect the output voltage will give you your acceleration of this mass by doing this feedback system okay now if we take this system we can put this into a block diagram the input to your system is now A. This is inertia. The force of the seismic mass is going to go to this accumulator. You have a spring of your sensor. Okay. You have the sensor, which is going to be a change in capacitor, an interface, which converts the charge to a voltage. We have some gain with the amplifier. And then in our feedback, we have this actuator, which is FA. And our output of our system is V0. Obviously, this is going to, we can model this with a second order system. Okay, now the different pieces of this HI is the transfer function from acceleration A to the inertial force FI. HS, the transfer from force FS on the sensor to the displacement delta X through the spring. HE is the transfer function from displacement to the output voltage. This basically has a sensor, the interface, and the gain element. And then HA is our transfer function for the actuator from the output voltage to FA that goes into the accumulator. Now these are independent of system parameters, spring, sensor, gain interface, etc. And it only depends on the mass and the actuators. We can go through and we can derive some of these. Um, I won't go over these today, but you should see how you should be familiar with being able to derive this um, equation that's highlighted in, in a yellow box. V out is equal to HI over HA times the input A. And, uh, and make sure that these make sense and you can derive that basic part. Now, if you do that, then we can define a mass spring damper system, which is a second order system. And we will um, have a little more practice with this later on in the course, where we have the transfer function HS is equal to delta X over this FS, which is basically this, the, the, the block between FI and V out. And we, this is a standard form for a second order system where omega sub zero is equal to the resonant frequency and that's defined as the square root of k over m. k is the effective spring constant of the system. And then we have a damping constant. And uh, we should be familiar with these types of representations for second order systems. If you look at V out and we represent this with a second order system, then we can see that a higher resonant frequency gives us less damping and we can characterize the system for how we want this thing to behave. Okay, so that's the end of lecture number two, Mate Technique, 13 November 2013. Thank you.